Book One, Chapter Six of Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strangers and Pilgrims, Book One, Chapter Six. When God smote his hands together and struck out thy soul as a spark into the organized glory of things from deeps of the dark, say didst thou shine didst thou burn didst thou honour the power in the form as the star does at night or the firefly or even the little ground worm i have sinned she said for my seed light shed has smouldered away from his first decrees the cypress praiseth the firefly the ground leaf praiseth the worm i am viler than these and what had malcolm ford done the question was one which that gentleman demanded of himself not unfrequently during the next few weeks was it wise or foolish to have bared this old wound before the pitying or unpitying eyes of elizabeth luttrell to have made this appeal for womanly sympathy he who was by nature so reticent who had kept his grief so sternly locked within his own breast until now was it wise or foolish was he right in deeming her nobler than the common herd of women a soul with whom it might be sweet to hold friendship's calm communion a woman whom he dared cultivate as his friends he had not even yet fully resolved upon this point but of possible peril to himself in any such association he had never dreamed long ago he had told himself that his heart was buried in alice fraser's grave laid at rest for ever in the hillside burial ground beneath the mountains that shelter lenorgi long ago he had solemnly devoted all the power of his intellect all the vigour of his manhood to the pursuit of a grander aim than that mere earthly happiness for which the majority of mankind searches from that burial of all his human hopes there could be no such thing as resurrection to be false to the memory of his lost bride to forswear the oath he made to himself when he took his priestly vows with a wider or a sterner view of the priestly office than is common to english churchmen to do this would be to stamp himself for ever in his own esteem the weakest and meanest of mankind such a thing was simply impossible he had therefore no snare to dread in friendly companionship with a bright generous-hearted young creature who was infinitely superior to her surroundings a faulty soul vaguely struggling toward a purer atmosphere a woman whom he might help to be good he felt that here was a noble nature in sore peril of shipwreck a creature with the grandest capabilities who might for lack of culture achieve nothing but evil a soul too easily led astray a heart too impulsive to resist temptation if she were my sister i would make her one of the noblest women of her age he said to himself with a firm faith in his own influence upon this feebler feminine spirit her very faults would seem charming to some men he told himself sagely that variableness which makes her at times the most incomprehensible of women at other times the sweetest would lead a fool on to his destruction there was a day when i deemed her incapable of serious thought or unselfish work yet once awake to the sense of her obligations there has been no limit to her patience and devotion and he was the author of this awakening he felt a natural pride and delight in the knowledge of this he was the prometheus who had breathed the higher and more spiritual life into the nostrils of this lovely clay he had snatched her from the narrow influences of her home from the easy-going thoughtless father whose mind hardly soared above the consideration of his cellar or his dinner-table from the petty provincial society with its petty gossip about its own works and ways the fashions of its garments and its dinings and tea-drinkings and trivial domestic details from mrs smith's new parlour-maid to mrs brown's new bonnet it was something to have lifted her from this slav despond even to the outermost edge of a better world yet she had flashes of the old leaven intervals of retrogression that afflicted him sorely during that homeward drive from the picnic she had been all that the most exacting of mankind could desire sympathetic confiding 
understanding his every thought and eager to be understood candid unaffected womanly but when the drive was over she changed as quickly as cinderella at midnight's first fatal stroke all the glorious vestments of her regenerated soul had dropped away leaving the old familiar rags the flippancy the fastness the insolence of conscious beauty that earnest talk by the sundial which frederick melvin had watched from afar with jealous eyes had been in reality expostulation the curate had presumed to lecture his vicar's daughter not in an insolent hectoring spirit not in a tone to which she could fairly object but with a gentle gravity regretful that she who had so many gifts should yet fall short of perfection how can you talk such nonsense she exclaimed impetuously with an angry movement of her graceful shoulders you know there's no one perfect you know there's no one good are you not always hammering that at us in your sermons making believe to consider us the veriest dirt yes even mrs paul whaley of the dean in her new french bonnet i don't see any use in trying to please you there never was but one perfect woman and she's dead i do not think it very kind of you to speak like that said mr ford as if you grudged my praise of the dead no it's, it's not that but it seems hard that the living should suffer because because you choose to brood upon the memory of someone who was better than they i will not shape myself by any model however perfect why with a little bitter laugh if i were to become the faultless being you tell me i might make myself my perfection would only be a plagiarism i would rather be original and keep my sins besides what can my shortcomings matter to you they matter very much to me do you think i am interested in my congregation just for twenty minutes while i am preaching to them and that when i come down the pulpit stairs all interest ceases till my next sermon you should reserve your lectures for gertrude she enjoys sermonising and being sermonised i believe she keeps a journal of her spiritual progress i dare say she would like to show it to you no doubt you would find plenty of my sins duly booked on parenthesis your sister gertrude is a very admirable person and i was beginning to hope you would grow like her thanks for the compliment if i am in any danger of resembling gertrude i shall leave off trying to be good the first thing to-morrow morning good night miss luttrell i am not miss luttrell my name is elizabeth good night elizabeth he said very coldly and before she could speak again he was gone leaving her planted there by the sundial angry with herself and still more angry with him passionately jealous of that memory which was more to him than the best and brightest of living creatures alice fraser she said to herself alice fraser a scotch clergyman's daughter a girl who never had a well-made gown in her life i dare say it was her portrait i saw of the mantelpiece in his sitting-room no doubt a poor little namby-pamby face with pleading eyes always seeming to say forgive me for being a little better than everybody else and that cup and saucer under the glass shade hers no doubt used in her last illness poor girl it was hard to be stricken down like that and yet how sweet to die with his arms holding her his agonised face bent over hers his quivering lips bent close to hers to catch the last faint breath what was there in that poor little meek souled thing to hold him in life and after death to set a seal upon his strong heart and keep it even in her grave it's more than i can understand in the brief intervals of leisure which his daily duties left him very brief at the best mr ford found his thoughts return with a strange persistency to the image of elizabeth luttrell it was not that he saw her often or they had not encountered each other since the picnic the young lady having been absent when he paid his duty call at the vicarage it was perhaps because she was less agreeable than other women because she rebelled and defied him and argued with him flippantly 
where other damsels bowed down and worshipped because she had never weakened her optic nerves by a laborious course of tent stitch and satin stitch because she had refused to lead the choir of sunday school children or to take a class in the sunday school because she was in every respect save in her late amendment in the district visiting way exactly what a clergyman's daughter ought not to be that malcolm ford suffered his mind to dwell upon her in the dead watches of the night and gave her a very disproportionate amount of his consideration at all times and seasons of late he had been seriously disturbed about her for shortly after the picnic there came a change in the damsel's conduct a sad falling away in her district visiting the women whom she had attached to her bewailed this fact to mr ford i thought as how she'd been ill poor dear said one but when i went to church last sunday there she was with her head held high as ever like a queen bless her handsome face and more colour in her cheeks than she used to have she sent me a gown last week by the vicarage housemaid and a regular good un not a break in it but though i was humbly thankful i'd rather have seen her as i used to when she'd come and sit against my wash-tub reading the gospel he heard this lamentation in different forms from several women and after some inquiry discovered that except to visit a sick child elizabeth had not been among her people since the day of the picnic at lawborough beeches she had sent them tea and small benefactions of that kind by the hand of a menial benefactions for which they were duly grateful but they missed her visits not the less oh she's such good company remarked one woman not like most of your district visitors which make you feel that downhearted as if you'd had an undertaker talking to you she's got such pleasant lively ways and yet as pitiful as pitiful if there's sickness and she do make herself so at home in one's place let me dust your chimbley piece mrs morris she says to me and dusts it before i can look and sets the things out so pretty and brings me that there blue chancy vase next day bless her kind heart mr ford was deeply grieved by this falling off it seemed as if the promethean spark had been untimely blown out the beautiful clay was once more only clay he felt unspeakably disheartened by the straying of this one lamb which he had sought to gather into the fold once possessed of his facts he went straight away to the vicarage to remonstrate i do not care how obnoxious i render myself to her he thought i am not here to speak smooth words if her father neglects his duty there is so much more reason i should do mine the year had grown six weeks older since the picnic in summer time the luttrell girls with the exception of gertrude who was always busy lived for the most part a straggling life scattering themselves about garden and orchard and doing all things in a desultory manner in summer the curate might have felt tolerably sure of finding elizabeth alone under some favourite tree reading a novel or making believe to work to-day it was different the october afternoon was fine but chill he would have to seek his erring sister in the house to inquire for the vicar and the young ladies after the usual manner of visitors and to take his chance of getting a few words alone with elizabeth he looked right and left of the winding path as he went from the garden gate to the house but saw no glimpse of female apparel athwart the tall hollyhocks so he was fain to go on to the hall door he was not particularly observant of details but it struck him that the grey old house had a smarter aspect than usual the carriage drive had been lately rolled there was even some indication of a thin coating of new gravel muslin curtains that were unfamiliar to his eyes shrouded the bow windows of the drawing-room and a little yapping black and tan terrier the veriest abbreviation of the dog species flew out of a half-open door to gird him as he rang the bell the vicarage parlour-maid a young woman he had prepared for confirmation twelve months before came smiling to admit him even she had an altered air more starch in her gown a smart white apron 
and cherry-coloured bows in her cap. "'Is Mr. Luttrell at home?' Oh, "'No, sir. Master went to Bulford in the pony chaise with Miss Luttrell directly after lunch. But the other young ladies are in the drawing-room, sir, and Mrs. Chevenix.' He went into the hall, a square low-ceilinged chamber, embellished with antiquated cabinets of cracked oriental china, an ancient barometer, a pair of antlers and a fox's brush lying among them, both trophies of the vicar's prowess in the field. A smoky-looking piece of still life, with the usual cut lemon and dead leveret and monster bunch of impossible grapes, the still smokier portrait of an old gentleman of the pigtail period, and sundry other specimens of art, which, massed into one lot and oddments at an auction, might possibly have realised a five-pound note. "'Mrs. Chevenix?' said the curate, interrogatively. Oh, "'Yes, sir, the young lady's aunt, sir. Master's sister?' "'Ah,' said Mr. Ford. He faintly remembered having heard of this lady, the well-to-do aunt and godmother who had given Diana the grand piano, an aunt who was sometimes alluded to confidently by Blanche as an authority upon all matters of taste and fashion, a person possessed of a universal knowledge of the lighter sort, whose judgment as to the best book or the cleverest picture of the season was a judgment beyond dispute, who knew the ins and outs of life aristocratic and life diplomatic, and would naturally be one of the first persons to be informed of an approaching marriage in fashionable circles, or an impending war. Without ever having seen this lady, Mr. Ford had, from his inner consciousness, as it were, evolved some faint image of her, and the image was eminently distasteful to him. He disliked Mrs. Chevenix, more or less on the Dr. Fell principle. The reason why he could not tell, but he most assuredly did dislike her. He could understand now that the new muslin curtains and the sprinkling of new gravel were expenses incurred in honour of this superior person. He kept his hat in his hand. He would have left it in the hall, most likely, had the young ladies been alone, and thus armed, went in to be presented to Mrs. Chevenix. "'Oh, how do you do, Mr. Ford?' cried Diana, bouncing up from the hearthrug, where she had been caressing the infinitesimal terrier. "'You're quite a stranger. We never see you now except in church. Let me present you to my aunt, Mrs. Chevenix.' He had a sense of something large and brown and rustling, rising with a stately air between him and the light, and then slowly sinking into the luxurious depths of a capacious armchair, a chair not indigenous to the vicarage drawing-room, evidently an additional luxury provided for Aunt Chevenix. He had shaken hands with Diana and bowed to Aunt Chevenix, who maintained an aristocratic reserve on the subject of handshaking, and did not go about the world offering her hand to the first comer, in a somewhat absent-minded manner. He had performed these two ceremonies with his eyes wandering in quest of that other Miss Luttrell for whose special behalf he had come to the vicarage. She, Elizabeth, sat in a low chair by the fire, reading a novel, the very picture of contented idleness. She, too, like the house, seemed to him altered. Her garments had a more fashionable air. That Puritan simplicity she had assumed at the beginning of her career as a district visitor was entirely discarded. She wore lockets and trinkets which he had not seen her wear of late, and rich plaits of dark brown hair were piled high on the graceful head, like the pictures in fashion books. She rose now to greet him with a languid air, an elegant indifference of manner which he surmised had been imparted by the stately personage in lustrous brown silk. They shook hands coldly enough on both sides, and Elizabeth resumed her seat, with her book open in her lap. Mrs. Chevenix sat with her portly brown silk back towards the bow window. It was one of Mrs. Chevenix's principles to sit with her back to the light, whereby a soupçon of pearl powder and hair dye was rendered less obvious to the observer. A beauty had Mrs. Chevenix been in her time, aye, and as acknowledged a beauty as Elizabeth Luttrell herself. 
although it would have cost malcolm forde a profound effort of faith to believe that vivid flashing brunette loveliness of elizabeth's could ever develop into the fleshly charms of the matron but in certain circles and in her own estimation mrs chevenix still took high rank as a fine woman she had arrived at that arid full-blown stage of existence in which a woman can only be distinguished as fine in which a carefully preserved figure and a complexion eked out by art are the last melancholy vestiges of departed beauty she was a large person with a large aquiline-nosed countenance framed by broad plaited bands of flaxen hair her cheeks bloomed with the florid bloom of middle age delicately toned down by a judicious application of pearl powder her arched eyebrows were several shades darker than her hair and a little too regular for nature her eyes were blue cold calculating eyes which looked as if they had never beheld the outer world as anything better than a theatre for the advancement and gratification of self or at least this was the idea which those chilly azure orbs inspired in the mind of mr forde as he sat opposite the lady talking small talk and telling diana lateral the news of his parish mrs chevenix had a certain good society manner which was as artificial as her eyebrows or the bluish white tints that toned her cheekbones and of this manner she kept two samples always in stock the gushing and vivacious style which she affected with people whom she deemed her superiors the listless and patronising or secondary manner wherewith she gratified her inferiors it was of course not likely that she would take the trouble to gush for her brother's curate even though he might be a person of decent family and possessed of independent means had he been an honourable a scion however remote of some distinguished house in the peerage she would have beamed upon him with her most entrancing smiles but an unknown scotchman a man who had been described to her as terribly in earnest a person of revolutionary principles who set himself against the existing order of things wanting to reform this and that and perhaps to level the convenient barriers which kept the common herd in their proper places a dismal person no doubt full of strange wailings like the ancient prophets whom she heard wonderingly sometimes at church giving them just as much attention as she could spare from the fair vista of new bonnets shining in a shaft of light from the gothic window and who seemed to her to have been distracted personages eminently ineligible for dinner parties aunt chevenix missed your sermon last sunday morning mr forde said diana she had one of her headaches and was afraid that the church might be hot in october said mr forde smiling our congregation is not vast enough for that he did not express any regret about his loss of such a hearer as aunt chevenix i'm really fond of a good sermon remarked the lady blandly trifling with a shining black fan wherewith she was wont to flap the empty air at all times and seasons this fan a gold-rimmed eyeglass and a double-headed scent bottle were mrs chevenix's only means of employment after she had read the morning post and accomplished her diurnal tale of letter-writing and good sermons are become so rare she went on in her slow pompous way i have heard no eloquent preacher for the last five years except the bishop of grantchester you wouldn't say that if you'd heard mr forde said diana mrs chevenix put up her eyeglass and looked at the curate with a languid smile as if with the aid of that instrument she was able to make a precise estimate of his powers mr forde is a young man my dear it is hardly fair to name him in the same breath with the bishop elizabeth who had been turning the leaves of her book listlessly with an air of absolute inattention flashed out at this mr forde is natural she said which is more than i can say for the bishop i admit his eloquence his grand bass voice sinking to an almost awful solemnity at every climax but it seems to me a tutored eloquence 
i could fancy him an actor in a greek play declaiming behind a mask mr ford a sudden pause as if she had been going to say a, a great deal and had hastily checked herself is different malcolm ford listened with eyes bent on the ground but just at the last words he raised those dark deep-set eyes and glanced at the speaker what a splendid face it was with its look of intense life its scorn of scorn or love of love a nature in all things intensified like that typical poet who in a golden clime was born yes she is a noble creature he said to himself no matter how capricious or fickle or unstable she is a creature of fire and light and she shall not be lost not for all the aunt chevenies in the world he cast a swift glance of defiance at the harmless matron in brown silk and flaxen plaits crowned with blonde and artificial roses as if she had been the foul fiend himself and he playing a desperate game of chess with her for this fair young soul he had always disliked the family fetish when she had been only a remote and unknown image to be invoked whenever there was a question of the proprieties but he disliked her most of all now when she was seated within the citadel and was poisoning the atmosphere of elizabeth's home with her worldly spirit he was swift to condemn and to suspect perhaps since he had seen very little of the lady as yet but that inane small talk that stale gossip of eaton square and lancaster gate that bismuth shaded cheek that practicable eyebrow which elevated itself with a trained expression of irony or drooped with a studied languor all these artificialities told him the nature of the woman and told him that she was the last of creatures whom he would care to see in daily communion with a girl whose wayward disposition had of late been curiously interesting to him that dogmatic assertion of his superiority even to a bishop hurled at the very teeth of the family idol pleased him mightily it was not conceit that was gratified it was sweet to him to discover that in spite of all her affected scorn this girl appreciated him he did not acknowledge her compliment except by one brief smile that slow quiet curve of the firm thoughtful lips which was sweeter than common smiles he went on patiently with the morning caller talk listened tolerantly to small scraps of information about the lancaster gateites until he could fairly rise to depart but he did not mean to leave the vicarage with his mission unfulfilled will you give me a few minutes in the garden he said in a low voice as he shook hands with elizabeth i want to talk to you about the cottagers the ears of the chevenie more acute than those chilly blue eyes which required the aid of binoculars pricked up at this sound of confidential converse did i hear you say something about cottagers mr ford she demanded sharply ah uh, yes he replied i was speaking of that order of creatures he was strongly tempted to add who do not inhabit lancaster gate but judiciously held his peace then i must beg that you do not put any more nonsense about district visiting into my niece's head it is all very well for gertrude who is strong physically and mentally and is not of so impressionable a nature as elizabeth and is some years older into the bargain i consider there is more than enough done for the poor in this place my brother gives away half his income and spends as much of his time amongst his parishioners as as his health will permit besides which he has of course a powerful auxiliary in his curate whose duty it is naturally to devote himself to that kind of thing and then there are always maiden ladies in a place uh, good-hearted dowdy souls who delight in that sort of work so that you can hardly be in want of aid 
but however that may be i cannot possibly allow my niece to fatigue herself and excite herself as she has done at your suggestion i found her in a really low state when i came here depressed in spirits and nervous to the last degree elizabeth flamed crimson at this how can you talk such nonsense aunt she cried angrily being the only one of the sisters who was not habitually overawed by aunt chevenix i am sure i was well enough but those london doctors put such twaddle in your head mrs chevenix sighed gently and gravely shook the head which was accused of harbouring professional twaddle if your niece is to go to heaven i fancy she will have to travel by her own line of country without reference to you mrs chevenix said malcolm forde i do not think she will submit to be forbidden to do her duty among her father's flock it is not a question of just what is most conducive to health or high spirits i do not say that i would have her this almost tender emphasis on the pronoun sacrifice health or length of years even for the holiest work but we know such sacrifices are only the natural expression of her perfect faith i am not asking her to do anything hard or unpleasant however for her the yoke may be of the easiest the burden of the lightest if you knew as i do how in two or three months she has contrived to win the hearts of these people what good her influence may do almost unconsciously on her part i think you would hardly talk about forbidding her to give some time and thought to her father's poor he spoke warmly and it was the first time that anything approaching praise had dropped from his lips elizabeth looked at him with a glowing face dark eyes that brightened as they looked oh, thank you mr forde she said i did not know i was of any use and i got disheartened and when aunt chevenix came i gave up the business altogether but i shall begin again to-morrow aunt chevenix stared at elizabeth and from elizabeth to mr forde with a stony stare of speechless indignation oh very well my dear she said to her niece at last of course you must know best what is conducive to your own happiness and then she sniffed a sniff as who should say i can bequeath my money elsewhere you have sisters my foolish elizabeth as dependent as yourself i can instruct my solicitor to prepare a codicil revoking that clause in my will which has reference to your interests mr forde had gained his point and cared very little what smothered fires might be glowing in the chavigny breast elizabeth went out into the garden with him bareheaded heedless of a chill october nor'wester and heard all he could tell her about her neglected poor questioning him eagerly poor souls are they really fond of me she exclaimed remorsefully i did not know it was in me to do any good on this malcolm forde grew eloquent told her as he had never told her before the value of such a soul as hers gifted with rare capabilities with powers so far above life's ordinary level urged her to rise superior to her surroundings to be something greater and better than the common new bonnet worshipping young ladyhood of hawley i am not depreciating your home or your family elizabeth he said remembering that she had accorded him this free use of her christian name but the world has grown so worldly even religion seems to have lost its spirituality there is a trading spirit an assumption of fashion in our very temples indeed i am sometimes doubtful whether our floral decorations and embroidered altar cloths are not a delusion and a snare it should be good to make our churches beautiful yet there are moments when i doubt the wisdom of these things they make too direct an appeal to the senses i find myself yearning for the stern simplicity of the scottish church 
that unembellished service which edward irving could make so vast an instrument for the regeneration of mankind he had no flower-decked chancel no white-robed choir it was only a voice crying in the wilderness this he said meditatively straying from the chief subject of his discourse and giving expression almost involuntarily to a doubt that had been tormenting him of late he brought himself back to the more personal question of elizabeth's spiritual welfare presently why did you keep away from your people he asked were you really ill or was it your aunt's influence she looked at him with a mischievous daring in her eyes neither one nor the other then why was it you had been going on so well and so steadily and i was beginning to be proud of you i trust this slowly and with hesitation i trust there was nothing i said that day at the picnic which could have had a deterring influence or which could have offended you i was not offended she answered her lips quivering faintly her face turned away from him what was there to offend me only you made me feel myself so poor a creature my highest efforts so infinitely beneath your ideal of perfect womanhood my feeble struggles at self-improvement so mean and futile measured by your heroic standard that i did perhaps feel a little discouraged and a little inclined to give up striving to make myself what nature had evidently not intended me to be an estimable woman nature intended you to be good and great answered mr ford earnestly yes but not like alice fraser said elizabeth with a bitter smile there are different kinds of perfection hers was an innate and unconscious purity a limitless power of self-sacrifice she was the ideal daughter of the manse a creature who had never known a selfish thought to whom the labours which i press upon you as a duty were a second nature she had never lived except for others i cannot say less or more of her than i told you that day she was simply perfect yet you have gifts which she did not possess a more energetic nature a quicker intelligence there is no good or noble work a woman can do in this world that you could not do if you chose elizabeth shook her head doubtfully i have no endurance she said i am vain and feeble oh believe me i have by no means a lofty estimate of my own character i require to be sustained by constant praise <laughs> it's all very well while you're encouraging me i feel capable of anything but when i've gone plodding on for two or three months longer and you take my good conduct for granted i shall grow weary again and fall away again not if you will look to a higher source for support and inspiration my praises are a very poor reward trust to the approval of your own conscience rather and forgive me if i urge you to keep yourself free from the influence of mrs chevenix it seems impertinent in me no doubt to presume to judge a lady i have only seen for half an hour oh pray don't apologise exclaimed elizabeth in her careless way i have a perfect appreciation of aunt chevenix she is the family idol the goddess whom we all worship conciliating her with all manner of sacrifices of our inclinations she presides over us in spirit even when at a distance imparting her oracles in letters of course she is the very essence of worldliness is it not written in all the roses that garnish her cap but she married a clever barrister who blossomed in due course into a county court judge and died five years ago of a fit of apoplexy which was considered the natural result of a prolonged series of dinners leaving aunt chevenix fifteen hundred a year at her own disposal she never had any children and we four girls are all she can boast of in the way of nephews or nieces 
so it is an understood thing that the fifteen hundred a year must ultimately come to us and we are paying aunt chevenix in advance for her bounty by deferring to her in all things she's not half so bad as you might suppose from her little pompous ways and her fan and her eyeglass and i really think she is fond of us not a pleasing confession to a man of malcolm ford's temperament from the lips of a beautiful girl this waiting for dead men's shoes was of all modern vices the one that seemed to him the meanest i hope you will not allow your conduct to be influenced by any consideration of your revisionary interest in mrs chevenix's income he said gravely oh, you've no fear of that she answered lightly i never took any one's advice in my life except perhaps yours and as to being dictated to by aunt chevenix that's quite out of the question i'm the only one of the family who defies her and strange to say i enjoy the reputation of being her favourite i don't wish you to defy her said mr ford with his serious smile she seemed to him at some moments only a wayward child this girl whom he was urging to become good and great you may be all that a niece should be kind affectionate and respectful and yet retain your right of judgment he looked at his watch he had been at the vicarage more than an hour and half that time had been spent walking to and fro beside the autumnal china asters and chrysanthemums with elizabeth for his companion i have detained you longer than i intended he said i shall tell mrs morris and mrs brown that you are coming to see them good-bye he stood by the broad barred gate a homely farmhouse looking gate painted white a tall vigorous figure unclerical of aspect with the erect soldierly air that had not departed from him on his change of profession a man who looked like a leader of men the dark earnest eyes looking downward at elizabeth the broad strong hand clasping hers with the firm clasp of friendship verily a tower of strength such a friend as this worth a legion of the common clay which men and women count as friends elizabeth stood by the gate watching him as he walked along the white high road toward hawley he looks like a red cross knight disguised in modern costume she said to herself he looks like hercules in a frock coat how different from slim mr adderley picking his steps upon the dusty causeway and now he will go from house to house and teach and read and exhort and help and counsel till ten o'clock to-night with only just time for a hasty dinner between his labours and yet he is never weary and never thinks his life barren and never longs to be in london among happy crowds of refined men and women enjoying all the delights that the science of pleasure can devise for them operas and concerts and races and picture shows and flower shows and a hundred gatherings together of taste and beauty and refinement does he ever long for that kind of life i wonder the very fringe or the outer edge of which is delightful if one may believe aunt chevenix or does he languish for a roving life as i do sometimes among fair strange countries sailing on the blue waters of the adriatic or the archipelago among the sunny islands of the old greek world or wandering in the shady depths of black forest or on the thymy mountain tops or amidst regions of everlasting snow has he no hours of vain despondency and longing as i have or did he concentrate all his hopes and desires upon alice fraser and bury them all in her grave she was in no hurry to return to the drawing-room fireside and the chevenix atmosphere of genteel idleness instead of going back to the house she went from the garden to the orchard and paced that grassy slope alone circulating slowly among the moss-grown trunks of the apple and cherry trees thinking of malcolm ford how good he is she said to herself how earnest and how real what a king among men and yet what hope is there for him in life 
what prospect of escape from this dull drudgery which he must surely sicken of sooner or later he has no interest that can advance him in the church i have heard him say that so his preferment will most likely be of the slowest i hardly wonder that he sometimes thinks of turning missionary better to be something to win some kind of name in the centre of africa or among the south sea islands than to be buried alive in such a place as hawley and if he ever were to change his mind and marry what a brilliant career for his wife she laughed bitterly at the thought <laughs> how i pity that poor demented soul whoever she may be and yet he seems to consider this kind of life perfect and that one might be good and great goodness and greatness consisting in perpetual district visiting unlimited plain needlework for the dorcas society unfailing attendance at early services all the dull dull routine of a christian life of the two careers i should certainly prefer africa and thus did she argue with herself this rebellious soul who could not understand that life was intended to afford her anything but pleasure the kind of pleasure her earthly nature pined for operas and concerts and horses and carriages and foreign travel she roamed the orchard for nearly an hour meditating upon malcolm ford his character his aspirations his prospects and that hypothetical foolish woman who might be rash enough to accept him for her husband and then went back to the drawing-room to be sharply interrogated by aunt chevenix my dear elizabeth what a dishevelled creature you've made yourself exclaimed that lady looking with disfavour at lizzie's loosened hair and disordered neck-ribbon the young ladies of eton place rarely expose themselves to the wind except at brighton in november when a certain license might be permitted i've been walking in the orchard aunt it's rather blowy on that side of the house i hope you've not had that mr ford with you all this time mr ford has been gone nearly an hour and i wish you wouldn't call him that mr ford you may not mean anything by it but it sounds unpleasant but i do mean something by it replied aunt chevenix fanning herself more vehemently than usual i mean that your mr ford is a most arrogant disagreeable underbred person to presume to dictate to my niece to override my authority before my very face the man is evidently utterly unaccustomed to good society you might have said that of st peter or st paul aunt replied elizabeth in her coolest manner neither of those belong to the eton place section of society but mr ford is a man of good family and was in a crack cavalry regiment before he entered the church so you are out in your reckoning a crack regiment echoed the matron elizabeth you have acquired a most horrible mode of expression perhaps you have learnt that from mr ford as well as a new version of your duty to your relations if ever that man was in a cavalry regiment i should think it must have been in the capacity of rough rider and what a man mountain that creature is too i should hardly have thought that any sane bishop would have ordained such a giant there ought really to be a standard height for the church as well as for the army excluding pygmies and giants i never beheld a man so opposite to one's ideal of a curate oh of course cried elizabeth impatiently your ideal curate is a slim simpering thing with white hands a bandboxical being talking solemn small talk like a fashionable doctor a kettle-drummish man always dropping in at afternoon tea we have had three of that species varying only in detail thank heaven malcolm ford is something better than that i cannot perceive that you have any occasion to feel grateful to providence upon the subject of mr ford's character and attributes let them be what they may said mrs chevenix and i consider that familiar mention of your father's curate a paid servant remember like a governess or a cook to the last degree indecorous 
but i do thank heaven for him cried elizabeth recklessly he is my friend and counsellor the only man i ever looked up to you appear to forget that you have a father murmured mrs chevenix sitting like a statue with her closed fan laid across her breast in a stand at ease manner i don't forget anything of the kind but i never looked up to him it isn't in human nature to reverence one's father one is behind the scenes of his life you see one knows all his little impatiences his unspiritual views on the subject of dinner his intolerance of crumpled rose leaves in his domestic arrangements papa is a dear old thing but he is of the earth and earthy mr ford is of another quality spiritual earnest self-sacrificing somewhat arbitrary perhaps in the consciousness of his own strength but gentle even when he commands capable of a heroic life which my poor feeble brain cannot even imagine his eager spirit even now yearning to carry god's truth to some wretched people buried in creation's primeval gloom ready to die a martyr in some nameless isle of the pacific in some unknown desert in central africa he is my modern st paul and i reverence him elizabeth indulged herself with this small tirade half in earnest half in a mocking spirit amusing herself with the discomfiture of aunt chevenix who sat staring at her in speechless horror the girl is stark mad gasped the matron with a faint flutter of her fan slowly recovering speech and motion has this sort of thing been going on long diana well not quite so bad as this replied diana but i don't think lizzie has been quite herself since she took up the district visiting she has left off wearing nice gloves and dressing for dinner and behaving in a general way like a christian has she indeed said aunt chevenix then the district visiting must be put a stop to at once and for ever or it will leave her stranded high and dry on the barren shore of old maidism you may be a very pretty girl elizabeth luttrell i dare say you know you are tolerably good-looking so there's no use in my pretending you are not but if once you take up ultra-religious views visiting the poor and all that kind of thing i wash my hands of you i had hoped to see you make a brilliant marriage indeed i have heard you talk somewhat overconfidently of your carriage your opera box and your town house and country seat but from what i hear to-day i conclude your highest ambition is to marry this preposterous curate who looks a great deal more like a brigand chief by the way and devote your future existence to sunday school teachings and tea meetings elizabeth stood tall and straight before her accuser with clasped hands resting on the back of a prie-dieu chair exactly as she had stood while she delivered her small rhapsody about mr ford stately and spiritual looking as joan of arc inspired by her voices perhaps after all it might be a woman's loftiest ambition to mate with malcolm ford she said slowly with a tender dreamy look in her eyes and then before the dragon could remonstrate she went on with a sudden change of manner don't be alarmed auntie i am not going to hold the world well lost for love i mean to have my opera box if it ever comes begging this way and to give great dinners with cabinet ministers and foreign ambassadors for my guests and to be mistress of a country seat or two and do wonderful things at elections and to be stared at at country race meetings and to tread in that exalted path in which you would desire to train my ignorant footsteps mrs chevenix gave a half despairing sigh you are a most incomprehensible girl she said and give me more trouble of mind than your three sisters put together but i do hope that you will keep clear of any entanglement with that tall curate a dangerous man i am convinced any flirtation of that kind would inevitably compromise you in the future 
as to cabinet dinners and country seats such marriages as you talk of are extremely rare nowadays and for a devonshire parson's daughter to make such a match would be a kind of miracle but with your advantages you ought certainly to marry well and it is better to look too high than too low a season in london might do wonders this london season was the shining bait which mrs chevenix was wont to dangle before the eyes of her nieces and by virtue of which she obtained their submission to her amiable caprices when the more remote advantage of inheritance might have failed to influence them gertrude and diana had enjoyed each her season and had not profited thereby in any substantial manner they had been much admired mrs chevenix declared with an approving air especially diana as the livelier of the two but admiration had not taken that definite form for which the soul of the matchmaker longeth there must be something wanting mrs chevenix said pensively in moments of confidence i find that something wanting in most of the girls of the present day alfred chevenix proposed to me in my first season i was a thoughtless thing just emerged from the nursery and his was not my only offer but my nieces made a very different effect young men were attentive to them sir harold hawback even seemed struck with diana but nothing came of it there must be a deficiency in something gertrude is too serious diana a shade too flippant it is manner my dear manner in which the rising generation is wanting a season in town cried elizabeth her dark eyes sparkling her head lifted with a superb arrogance and all thought of malcolm ford and the life spiritual for the moment banished oh yes it is my turn is it not auntie and i think it is time i came out who knows how soon i may begin to lose whatever good looks i now possess i am of a nervous temper impressionable as you suggested just now i have a knack of sleeping badly when my mind is full of a subject and excitement of any kind spoils my appetite even the idea of a new bonnet will keep me awake i lie tossing from side to side all night trying to determine whether it shall be pink or blue living at this rate i may be a positive fright before i'm twenty no complexion can stand against such wear and tear you have been allowed to grow up with a sadly undisciplined mind my poor child mrs chevenix said sententiously if your papa had engaged a competent governess a person who had lived in superior families and was experienced in the training of the human mind and the figure your waist measures two inches more than it ought to at your age his daughters would have done him much greater credit but it was only like my brother wilmot to grudge the expenditure of sixty guineas a year for a proper instructress of his daughters while frittering away hundreds on his pauper parishioners oh now that is one of the things for which i do reverence papa cried elizabeth with energy thank heaven neither our minds nor our bodies have been trained by a professional trainer imagine growing like a fruit tree nailed against a wall every spontaneous outshoot of one's character cut back every impulse pruned away as a non-fruit bearing branch i do bless papa with all my free untutored soul for having spared us that but don't let us quarrel about details dear auntie give me my season in london and see what i'll do i languish for my opera box and barouche and the kind of life one reads of in mrs gore's novels you shall spend next may and june with me said mrs chevenix with another plaintive sigh it will be hard work going over all the same ground again which i went over for gertie and i but the result may be more brilliant oh, couldn't you manage to turn me off at the same time auntie demanded blanche pertly 
i am sorry gertrude and i were not fortunate enough to receive proposals from dukes or merchant princes said diana whose aristocratic features had flushed angrily at her aunt's implied complaint perhaps we might have been luckier if we had met more people of that kind but of course lizzie will do wonders she reminds me of mirabeau's remark about robespierre she will do great things because she believes in herself elizabeth was prompt to respond to this attack and so with small sisterly bickerings the conversation ended end of chapter six book one chapter seven of strangers and pilgrims by mary elizabeth braddon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org strangers and pilgrims chapter seven je ne voudrais pas si j'étais jolie n'être que jolie avec ma beauté jusqu'au bout des droits je serais duchesse comme ma richesse j'aurais ma fierté elizabeth having in a manner pledged herself to a career of worldly mindedness to begin in the ensuing spring deemed herself at liberty to follow her own inclinations in the interim and these inclinations pointed to the kind of life which malcolm ford wished her to lead she went back to her district work on the morning after the curate's visit put on her puritan hat and sober grey carmelite gown which seemed to her mind the whole armour of righteousness and went back to her people she was welcomed back with an affection that at once surprised and touched her she had done so little for them only treating them and thinking of them as creatures of the same nature as herself and yet they were so grateful and so fond of her so elizabeth went back to what gertrude called her duties and the soul of aunt chevenix was heavy within her that lady had cherished high hopes upon the subject of this lovely niece of hers a perfect beauty in a family is a fortune in embryo there was no knowing what transcendent heights upon the vast mountain range of good society such a girl as elizabeth might scale dragging her kith and kin upwards with her provided she were but plastic in the hands of good advisers to scheme to plan to diplomatise were natural operations of the chevenix mind a childless widow with a comfortable income and a somewhat extended circle of acquaintance could hardly spend all her existence with no more mental pabulum than a fan and a scent bottle and the trivial amenities of polite life mrs chevenix's intellect must have lapsed into stagnation but for the agreeable employment afforded by social diplomacy she knew everything about everybody kept a mental ledger in which she registered all the little weaknesses of her acquaintance and had even a journal wherein a good deal of genteel scandal was booked in pen and ink but although by no means essentially good-natured she was not a mischief-maker and no unfriendly criticism or ladylike scandal had ever been brought home to her she was on the other hand renowned as a peacemaker and if she had a fault it was a species of amiable officiousness which some of her acquaintance were inwardly inclined to resent malign tongues had called mrs chevenix a busybody but in the general opinion she was a lady of vivacious and agreeable manners who gave snug little dinners and elegant little suppers after concerts and operas and was a fine figure for garden parties or a spare seat at the dinner-table a lady who had done some good service in the way of matchmaking and who exercised considerable influence over the minds of divers young matrons whom she had assisted in the achievement of their matrimonial successes it seemed a hard thing that after having been so useful an ally to various damsels who were only the proteges of the hour mrs chevenix's diplomatic efforts in relation to her own nieces should result in utter failure she had never hoped very much from gertrude who had that air of being too good for this world which of all things is the most repellent to sinful man still even for gertrude mrs chevenix had done her best bravely and with the sublime patience engendered by profound experience of this mundane sphere its difficulties and disappointments 
she had exhibited her seriously minded niece at charity bazaars at dejeuners given after the inauguration of church organs at choir festivals and even with a noble sacrifice of personal inclination at sunday school tea drinkings orphanage fates and other assemblages of what this worldly minded matron called the goody goody school she had angled for popular preachers for rectors and vicars the value of whose benefices she had looked up in the clergy list but she had cast her lines in vain the popular preachers crying from their pulpits that all is vanity were yet caught moth-like by the flame of worldly beauties and left gertrude to console herself with the calm contemplation of her own virtues and the conviction that they were somewhat too lofty for the appreciation of vulgar clay it had happened thus that with the advent of malcolm forde the eldest miss luttrell fancied she had at last met the elect and privileged individual predestined to sympathise with and understand her the man upon whose broad forehead she at once recognised the apostolic grace and who she fondly hoped would hail in her the typical maiden of the church primitive and undefiled the dorcas or lydia of modern civilisation it had been a somewhat bitter disappointment therefore to discover that mr ford although prompt with the bestowal of his confidence and friendship was very slow to exhibit any token of a warmer regard surely he so different in every attribute from all former curates was not going to resemble them in their foolish worship at the shrine of elizabeth so long as this damsel had stuck to her accustomed line of worldliness gertrude had scarcely trembled but when her younger sister all of a sudden subdued her somewhat reckless spirit and took to district visiting miss luttrell's heart sank within her she had no belief in the reality of this conversion it was a glaring and bold-faced attempt at the curate's subjugation to bend that stiff neck beneath the yoke which had been worn so patiently by the flute-playing verse-quoting levites of the past and gertrude did not hesitate to express herself in somewhat bitter phrases to that effect when diana came to eaton place for the season the hopes of aunt chevenix rose higher the second miss luttrell was decidedly handsome in the aquiline nose style and was as decidedly stylish wore her country-made gowns with an air which made them pass for the handicraft of a west end mantua maker dressed her own hair with a skill which would have done credit to an experienced lady's maid and seemed altogether an advantageous young person for whom to labour yet diana's season though brightened by many a hopeful ray had been barren of results perhaps these girls in their aunt's house were too obviously on view mrs chevenix's renown as a matchmaker may have gone against them her past successes may have induced this present failure and if gertrude erred on the side of piety diana possibly went a thought too far in the matter of worldliness she was clever and imitative and caught up in the manners of more experienced damsel with a readiness that was perhaps too ready she had perhaps a trifle too much confidence in herself too much of the veni vidi vici style went into battle with an opera box and a house in hyde park gardens blazoned on her banner and after suffering the fitful fever of high hopes that alternate with blank despair diana was fain to go back to hawley vicarage without being able to boast of any definite offer but with elizabeth mrs chevenix told herself things would be utterly different she possessed that rare beauty which always commands attention she was as perfect in her line as those heaven-born winners of the derby oaks and ledger which by their performances as two-year-olds proclaimed themselves at once the conquerors of the coming year fairly good-looking girls were abundant enough every season just as fairly good horses abound at every sale of yearlings throughout the sporting year but there was as much difference between elizabeth luttrell and the common herd of pretty girls or more or less dependent on the style of their bonnets or the dressing of their hair for their good looks as between the fifty guinea colt whose good points excite vague hopes of future merit in the breast of the speculative buyer 
and a lordling of a crack stable with a pedigree half a yard long knocked down for two or three thousand guineas to some magnate of the turf amidst the applause of the auction yard elizabeth cannot fail to marry well unless she behaves like an idiot and throws herself away on some pauper curate said mrs chevenix there is no position to which a girl with her advantages may not aspire and i shall make it my business to give her plenty of opportunities unless she is obstinately bent upon standing in her own light this district visiting business must be put a stop to immediately it is nothing more than an excuse for flirting with that tall curate mrs chevenix was not slow to warn her brother the vicar of this peril which menaced his handsomest daughter but he who was the easiest tempered and least designing of mankind received her information with a provoking coolness i really can't see how i could object to lizzie's visiting the poor he said it has always been a trouble to me that my daughters with the exception of gertrude have done so little if ford has brought about a better state of things in this matter as he has in a good deal besides i don't see that i can complain of the improvement because it's his doing and i don't think you need alarm yourself with regard to any danger of love-making or matrimony between those two ford has somewhat advanced notions and doesn't approve of a priest marrying he's almost said as much in the pulpit and i think the holy girls have left off setting their caps at him men are not always constant in their opinions said mrs chevenix i wouldn't give much for any declaration mr ford may have made in the pulpit it was very bad taste in him to advance any opinion of that kind i think when his vicar is a married man and a father of a family oh, ford belongs to the new school replied mr luttrell with his good-natured air perhaps he sometimes sails a trifle too near the wind in the matter of asceticism but he's the best curate i ever had <laughs> why doesn't he go over to rome and have done with it exclaimed aunt chevenix angrily i have no patience with such a wolf in sheep's clothing and i have no patience with you wilmot when i see your handsomest daughter throwing herself away before your eyes but i don't see anything of the kind maria said the vicar gently rolling his fingers round a cigar which he meant to smoke in the orchard as soon as he could escape from his tormentor as to playing the spy upon my children watching their flirtations with jones or speculating upon their penchant for robinson i think you ought to know by this time that i am the very last of men to do anything of that kind which means in plain english that you are too selfish and too indifferent to trouble yourself about the fate of your daughters you ought to have had sons wilmot young scapegraces who would have ruined you with university debts or gone on the turf and dragged your name through the mire in that way i have not been blessed with sons murmured mr luttrell in his laziest tone if i had been favoured in that way so soon as they arrived at an eligible age i should have exported them i should have obtained a government grant of land in australia or british columbia and planted them out i consider emigration the natural channel for the disposal of surplus sons oh you ought never to have married wilmot you ought to have been one of those dreadful abbots one reads of who had trout streams running through their kitchens and devoted all the strength of their minds to eating and drinking and actually wallowed in venison and larded capons those ancient abbots had by no means a bad time of it my dear replied the vicar with supreme good humour and they had plenty of broken victuals to feed their poor with which i have not i want to know what you are going to do about elizabeth said mrs chevenix rapping the table with her fan and returning to the charge in a determined manner what i am going to do about elizabeth my love simply nothing would you have me lock her up in the norman tower like a princess in a fairy tale so that she should not behold the face of man till i chose to introduce her to a husband of my own selection 
all the legendary law we possess tends to show the futility of that sort of domestic tyranny i consider your apprehensions altogether premature and groundless but if it is lizzie's destiny to marry malcolm ford i shall not interfere he's a very good fellow and he has some private means sufficient at any rate for the maintenance of a wife and what more could i want and you would sacrifice such a girl as elizabeth to a scotch curate said mrs chevenix with the calmness of despair i always thought that you were the most short-sighted of mortals but i did not believe you capable of such egregious folly as this that girl might be a duchess find me a duke my dear maria and i will not object to him for my son-in-law mrs chevenix sighed and shook her head with a despondent air and mr luttrell strolled out to the orchard leaving her to bewail his folly in a confidential converse with diana who in a manner represented the worldly wisdom of the family i wouldn't make such a fuss about lizzie if i were you auntie that young lady remarked somewhat coolly i never knew a girl about whom her people made too much fuss setting her up as a beauty and so on do anything wonderful in the way of marriage like the eyes of the lynx in his matchless strength of vision were the eyes of aunt chevenix for any sentimental converse between elizabeth and mr ford it tortured her to know that they must needs have many opportunities of meeting outside the range of that keen vision chance encounters in the cottages of the poor or in the obscure lanes and alleys that fringed the chief street of hawley vainly had she endeavoured to cajole her niece into the abandonment of those duties she had newly resumed all her arguments her flatteries her ridicule her little offerings of ribbons and laces and small trinketry were wasted after that visit of malcolm ford's the girl was constant to her work it is such a happiness to feel that i can be of some use in the world auntie she said unconsciously repeating mr ford's very words and if you'd seen how pleased those poor souls were to see me amongst them again you would hardly wonder at my liking the work a tribe of sycophants exclaimed mrs chevenix contemptuously i should like to know what value they'd attach to your visits or how much civility they'd show you if there were not tea and sugar and coals and blankets in the background and i should like to know how long you'd stick to your work if mr ford had left hawley elizabeth flamed crimson at this accusation but was not of a temper to be silenced by a hundred chevenix perhaps i might not like the work without his approval she said defiantly but i hope i should go on with it all the same i am not at all afraid to confess that his influence first set me thinking that it was to please him i first tried to be good i am not an ultra-religious person elizabeth but i should call that setting the creature above the creator said mrs chevenix severely to which lizzie muttered something that sounded like bosh what else is there for me to do i should like to know the girl demanded contemptuously after an interval of silence mrs chevenix having retired within herself in a dignified sulkiness is there any amusement or any excitement or any distraction in our life in this place to hinder my devoting myself to these people this speech was somewhat reassuring to mrs chevenix she inferred therefrom that if elizabeth had had anything more agreeable to do she would not have become a district visitor you have a fine voice which you might cultivate to your future profit she said a girl who sings really well is likely to make a great success in society oh i understand one gets asked out to entertain other people's friends and one is not paid like a professional singer i like music well enough aunt but you can't imagine i could spend half my existence in screeching solfeggi even if papa would tolerate the noise i'm sure what with one and another of us the piano is jingling and clattering all day as it is 
pa and the servants must execrate the sound of it blanche with her etudes de velocite and die with her everlasting fugues and sonatas it's something abominable you might have a piano in your tower bedroom my dear i wouldn't mind making you a present of a cottage thanks auntie let it be a real cottage then instead of a cottage piano <laughs> against i set up that love in a cottage that you seem so much afraid of upon my word elizabeth i can never make you out said mrs chevenix plaintively sometimes i think you are a really sensible girl and at other times you really appear capable of any absurdity don't be frightened auntie it rather amuses me to see your awe-stricken look when i say anything particularly wild but you need have no misgivings about me i am worldly-minded to the tips of my nails as the french say and i am perfectly aware that i am rather good-looking and ought to make an advantageous marriage only the eligible suitor is a long time appearing perhaps i shall meet him next spring in eaton place and as to mr ford he is quite out of the question i know all about his past life and i know that he is a confirmed bachelor your confirmed bachelors are a very dangerous race elizabeth said mrs chevenix sententiously they contrive to throw families off their guard by their false pretences and generally end by marrying a beauty or an heiress but i trust you have too much common sense to take up with a man who can barely afford to keep you by such small doses of worldly wise counsel did mrs chevenix strive to fortify her niece against the peril of malcolm ford's influence her sharp eye had discovered something more than common kindliness in the curate's bearing towards elizabeth something more than a mere spirit of contradiction in the girl's liking for him but there was time enough yet she told herself and the tender sprout of passion might by a little judicious management be nipped in the bud she would not even wait for the coming spring she thought but would carry off elizabeth with her when she went back to town a little before christmas she had intended to spend that social season in a hospitable wiltshire manor house but that visit might be deferred anything was better than to leave her niece exposed to the perilous influence of malcolm ford again and again had she made a mental review of the tritons in the matrimonial market or rather of those special tritons who might be brought within the narrow waters of her own drawing-room or could be encountered at will in that wider sea of society to which she had free ingress there was sir rockingham pendarvis the rich cornish baronet whom it had been her privilege to meet at the dinner-parties of her own particular set and who might be fairly counted upon for daily tea-drinking and occasional snug little dinners there was mr maltby the great distiller who had lately inherited a business popularly estimated at a hundred thousand a year there was mr miguel zamirez the financier with a lion's share in the public funds of various nations aquiline nosed and olive skinned speaking a peculiar spanish english with a somewhat guttural accent these three were the mightier argosies that sailed upon society's smooth ocean but there were numerous craft of smaller tonnage whereof mrs chevenix kept a record and any one of which would be a prize worth boarding inscrutable are the decrees of the gods while this diplomatic matron was weaving her web for the next london season even planning her little dinners reckoning the expenses of the campaign resolving to do things with a somewhat lavish hand fate brought a nobler prize than any she had dared to dream of winning and landed it without effort of her own at her feet End of chapter 7